What's up, guys? Rachel Daniels here, aka the Real Lois Lane, and we are back today with another aw awesome episode of Tight Net Time. And as you see today, this is not John. I <laughs> we have a special <laughs> guest here today, so I'm gonna let her go ahead and introduce herself before we start. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. You're welcome. Uh, my name is Brooke Morso. I am CEO of Physique by Science, uh, my own online fitness coaching company. Um, I have a bachelor's in biomedical sciences and I'm currently pursuing a master's in exercise science, specializing in physique enhancement. And I'm a former competitor, so. You're a current competitor too. Current competitor. You're getting back on stage in 12 what, 12 weeks? weeks? So. Yeah, yeah, super cool. So Brooke is really awesome because well, she goes to my gym. I've seen her train. I've, I've heard her, you know, I've watched her clients and seen her work and she's very smart. She's very educated on, like she said, biomechanics as well as nutrition. And uh, she trains smart, she diets smart, and that's what we are all about here at Titan Medical, as you know. So it's a real pleasure to have her on the show today. Obviously, we're reaching out with an emphasis on all our females getting into the fitness lifestyle. So it's great to have another female in the industry yeah. with both the educational background and she is a, like she said, a competitor mm -hmm. as well. So that gives her both sides, um, both sides to kind of give us our information on. Uh, it's mm -hmm. always good to have that dynamic. Yeah. And so, yeah, so let's get started. So today we're going to talk about a pretty sensitive topic that I think isn't talked about enough but needs to be and 100%. Brooke and I have talked about doing it talking about this for a while because we see it a lot in our clients and as athletes we've experienced it as well and we know yeah. that other athletes are experiencing it and not just athletes but anybody in hard who's dieting or hard dieting or just dieting a little there's yeah. a lot of things that can go on and that leads us to our topic which is eating disorders and the fitness industry so there's a lot of different types of eating disorders, but we're gonna talk more about binge eating disorders. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, there's a there might be a lot of literature on binge eating in general, but there's not a whole lot on binge eating in athletes yeah. and in people in the fitness industry, not just athletes, but people who are, you know, just dieting overall to get a good physique. So we're gonna touch on athletes and binge eating, and we're gonna talk on just mm -hmm. the general population and binge eating. So. Just before we get started, let's go over what is binge eating. So binge eating is characterized by significant reoccurring disturbances or episodes of overeating, right? Overeating mm -hmm. by fe like, and this is triggered by feelings of lack of control, uh, distress about body shape and weight, things like that. So mm -hmm. we see that a lot in at least athletes, at least from my perspective, you know, we've been in caloric deficits for so long you kind of get we call it like prep goggles yeah you stop seeing how you really look and um when you hard diet for a long time it, you can develop a negative relationship with food or an unhealthy relationship with yeah. food yeah so i'm sure you see this a lot too with your clients well in terms of clients and then myself um just based on like experience like right before anybody goes into a calorie deficit or dieting i make them very aware the leaner you get, you're going to become more food focused. Right. And I wish somebody would would have told me that before mm -hmm. I dieted for my first show and or just lost a significant amount of weight and then you find yourself right. focusing on foods that you've never even liked before. Right. Like finding yourself going to the ice cream aisle and you hyper palatable like, foods, right? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's like why do I want ice cream? I don't even this doesn't contribute to anything that I want to do. You've never had that craving before, right? I've had yeah. things on prep like that. Like all of a sudden all I want is just like massive amounts of peanut butter or yeah. like some weird candy bar that I've I never ate before I became a bodybuilder and all of a sudden that's all I want. It's like when pregnant women have like these <laughs> random cravings all of a sudden they're like, I want grapes, just a grapes. I'm like, yeah. what? You know, it's kind of the same thing. Yeah. So I mean, there's prevalence rates of this binge eating disorder among athletes and the general population, but some research has shown that it's higher among mm -hmm. athletes than it is among the general population. And that seems kind of obvious we, we, that we can make that you know assumption um, due to the fact that athletes are doing extreme rigid dieting practices. They have a preoccupation with their body weight. You know, a lot of people yeah. have to make weight if you're 
doing a, a fight, wrestler. a wrestler, yeah. you know, um, even bodybuilders, they have to make weight in certain classes. And even if they don't have to make weight, there's... Well, I mean, you're, 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 the sport is literally like, oh, am I lean enough? How do I look, I want right? to look leaner. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, that's the sport. It's like, uh-huh. cool, like, there's body fat on me. That's associated with something negative. Where, re- in reality, like, you need some right, body you fat. Right, do. Like, making that apparent that competing in bodybuilding is not a lifestyle look right as well so it's not yeah it's not an attainable look uh, i'm sorry a sustain it's attainable but it's not sustainable for a long amount of time and i think that also plays on to the general population who's dieting you know they see all these instagram models and athletes who are just they look like they're like that all the time maybe they are but also you know instagram and social media can play lots of tricks on you um they're and they're not like that all the time and that can give the unwarranted focus on the general population to think like i have to be this body weight i have to be this shape i should look Mm -hmm. better this person looks better than me and this can lead to um dieting which isn't a bad thing but once it becomes once you go for a long amount of time on a caloric restriction things start happening not just to your hormones but they start happening to your outlook on food like like brooke said like you might start feeling some. I know a lot of athletes after they've been in prep for a long time, they might mm-hmm. start feeling guilty about foods, about eating when yeah. they're allowed to, you know, after a show. And that's why I think it's really important to take breaks and have balance, whether you're a competitor or not. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I didn't have any balance when I first started. I'm still working on my balance, um, but it go it, it it goes both ways for athletes and non athletes. So mm-hmm. that leads us to. Finding the balance, that leads us to like talking about some things like risk factors, right? So Mm -hmm. we know that if you're engaging in dieting or any type of, you have some sort of look that you want to look that's above average with your physique, whether it's just lifestyle or an athletic Mm -hmm. endeavor, we know that the prevalence rates of binge eating disorder are higher. So how do we look at risk factors? What are some risk factors that the general population can look out for and athletes as well? So a couple of the you guys that one? Oh yeah, I was gonna say in terms of athletes, I find people who aren't conscious of tracking calories, they actually end up under eating right. most of the time. So a lot of athletes I was a college athlete, mm-hmm. um, as well before bodybuilding and all right. this. I swam. Mm-hmm. Um, and I honestly was so busy, I found myself just under eating, and then you hear people, oh, I'm, I'm hungry all the time. Well, it's likely because you're under eating, and you're usually choosing foods that aren't going to make you feel very full anyways. Right, yeah, that's so true. It, right, satiating you, foods. And, and that's another one. Like, mm-hmm. filling your diet with, like, highly processed foods can lead to more food focus for those foods. Right. Um, for sure, that's what I've found as well. Yeah, and that's actually a good point. I'm gonna we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, the different mechanisms and a couple different theories of what engaging in too many hyper palatable foods in your diet will do to you in response to a binge eating cycle, and what not having those yeah. quite the opposite, the limiting limiting those hyper palatable foods for a long amount of time. What's that gonna do to you is risk wise mm-hmm. for binge eating. So um, next, we're gonna talk about. So, like we said, there's a couple risk factors. Rigid rigid dieting practices for extended amounts of time. Preoccupation with body weight and composition. That's another risk factor for for, uh, binge eating disorder. And there are individuals who experience, obviously environment's really important. So individuals who Mm -hmm. experience really high internal or external pressures for weight loss, they're also at a risk of developing the disorder in speed of I, I honestly think speed of dieting as well so yeah. if you try to lose weight very very quickly your food focus is going to increase because it's not sustainable so it's if, true. if you're dieting I tell people or I employ principles that it's like you make this a lifestyle and you lose about a pound to two pounds a week yeah and you're less likely to overeat right yeah and I mean I know it gets it gets tricky like the longer mm-hmm. you do this too you know at first i never really had i never really thought twice about my relationship with this food before i started bodybuilding i just ate when i was hungry and i didn't think about it Me too. Been, you know i didn't i never had a really a weight issue so i i can't speak on that i was never mm-hmm. overweight um if anything i was probably closer to underweight <laughs> but i always could eat whatever i want and it kind of mm-hmm. didn't 
really changed my my body too much so mm-hmm. I was never super fixated on food, food or my relationship with it or attaching any negative or positive emotion to it when yeah. I did um and I find the longer you do a sport like bodybuilding it becomes harder to differentiate when you're actually hungry or when you're you know stressed you're out from your environment as well. yeah impulsive sort of eating as well and that's more what binge eating is right it's not mm-hmm. It's not bulimia. It's not anorexia. It's in response to Mm -hmm. triggers and things like that and feelings of control. And I think there's also a difference between binge eating behavior and having binge eating disorder. That's a great point. Yeah. We're going to actually talk about next are some of the cycles of binge eating. And that's a great point that you said because Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people don't know how to differentiate the, the difference between... Just a, like, right, so a casual, mm-hmm. so you know you go out for, everyone goes out and overeats a little sometimes, right? That doesn't right. mean you have a eating disorder, right. right? We've all gone out on to our family's house on Thanksgiving and had too much turkey had, and had dessert. Had a and, huge meal and it's yeah, like. And you, and you know you're yeah. eating too much, but it, you're fine, yeah. right? So that's, that's, not, that's not unnatural and neither is, you know, we all, it, especially in a culture where we, we eat to in response to emotion and we're yeah. also a very social culture that focuses social interaction around eating you know a lot of times like hey let's get together have some lunch right i'll come over for dinner we'll talk about this we'll do this it's all centered around food mm-hmm. so just because you you know overeat every now and then or you had too much ice cream one night or something <laughs> with the family holidays that's not what we're saying here is an eating disorder mm-hmm. so as we go along our next our next point is going to show you some of our examples our, our of- examples of how this cycle kind of differentiates yeah so our first model up here and we're going to put it up on the screen for you uh is the binge eating continuum Mm -hmm. right so this is kind of what we talked about so it starts with occasional overeating right like we talked about you know something i had too much ice cream i knew i was full but it tasted good i kept eating it right (laughs) right occasion right and then that might turn into occasional binges so not just one an extra amount of one meal. Then we're talking about more multiple, m- like multiple, multiple meals, for a week, or I would like, say, right, like or just multi- a higher caloric meal number in a short mm-hmm. period of time. So instead of some extra ice cream, was a couple hundred calories. Now we're we're shoving in like a thousand, a thousand. A thousand. Well, for me, maybe a three, four, five. I'm just kidding, but yeah, a ma- bigger, bigger volume caloric meals mm-hmm. in a short period of time, right? And then we move on to a sub threshold of BD. So then we start going into how often is this occurring, right? All right, so this is our se- this is our second uh, cycle pictured. So this is a little more in depth of when we are in an actual binge eating disorder. So we've, we've established the difference mm-hmm. between just occasional overeating into a binge eating disorder. And mm-hmm. binge eating disorder is also differentiated from just occasional overeating by how often this is happening right. and the amounts of food in the time period that it's happening and what's it in response to. So a couple things that can trigger this is you might have internal or external pressures focusing on um, body composition, weight, yeah. putting the pressure on you. Like mm-hmm. something might just a, really... A deadline? Like yeah, a deadline. deadline or something something that's giving you anxiety and you're feeling a lack of control, like right? You have to do something almost. Like if yeah. you have to show up for an event and there could be this external pressure to lose weight, um, right. look leaner. And body maybe a deadline's getting closer. It's kind of freaking you out. People are saying you're not ready or mm-hmm. people are putting a lot of pressure on you to win something. So those are good examples of that. Or in just a normal lifestyle thing, you might have some event happen in your life. Like, like you get an a, exam. Yeah, an, an exam. exam you get in a fight with your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your husband. Something really bad happens at work. These are all triggers, right? So there's psychological triggers where you're feeling out of control. You're in an anxious state, things like that. So... Or we can just be in a caloric def- deficit for a long amount of time, which yeah. messes with your um, cues of being satiated. So your cues of being full and your body telling you, I don't need food right now, I'm all set. Um, you're Because you're not, if you're in a prolonged state of a caloric deficit. Mm-hmm. So then either way, whatever these triggers are, whatever the reasons are we are here, we have this desire to lose body weight and decrease fat, right? Yes. So we start our diet. We go on restrictive dieting, to, mm-hmm. whether you're an athlete or whether you're just trying to lose weight for, for your wedding, right? So we're in this restrictive yes. dieting stage. It's been a good amount of time. We've been in a caloric deficit. Obviously, naturally, we start to get these feelings of hunger, hunger cravings. Oh, my God, I'm starting to get hungry. My metabolism's jumping, things like that. Mm-hmm. Then we have this binge episode where you just you just eat everything. You just break down for no reason. So in bodybuilding, we call it cheating. You cheated on your diet. You were yeah. unfaithful to your diet. 
you broke down and you ate whatever you wanted. You know, you ate all the chips, the pancakes, whatever's in your house, anything goes. That's from goes. restriction, for sure. It's from following such rigid structure and plan and expectations, I feel like, also drive the desire to overeat as well. Absolutely. I've, I've found in my career, especially as a pro bodybuilder, um, the, the times that I've felt the most out of control where I felt like... You know, as an amateur, sometimes I felt like I I, mm-hmm. I cheated less because I didn't I Had didn't have to do that, yeah. right? I didn't have to do this, and then I was just doing it because I wanted to. So I had that sense of control. But sometimes as a pro, I feel like, oh my gosh, I have to do this. I have to diet, mm-hmm. or because this is my job now, I have to do this, or I'm gonna let you know my fans down. I'm gonna let my sponsors down. I'm gonna let right. my family down. I'm gonna let myself down. People are expecting things of me. I have things yeah. to lose now, right? So for me, that would trigger me to feel out of control. And I've found when I've let myself get into states like that, that's when I've had binge eating episodes. The worst is like the the expectation. Yeah. Um, And honestly, like having like a day off, like an untracked meal in a healthy way, like is something that number one, I'm working on. And I encourage people to do more is like have an untracked meal. Right. Practice the control of eating something without knowing yeah. everything and my advice is you know athlete or not to take diet breaks and yes. that doesn't mean you have to like go out and eat like crap for three weeks but if you're doing shows constantly back to back as an athlete you need to take a break um if you're if you're hard dieting mm-hmm. even not as an athlete you should learn how to not eliminate all your social your social, social endeavors things. your family things where you're going out because you say i can't eat that i did that for a long time i didn't show up to holiday events me too anything like that because i just wouldn't be around it and i isolated myself mm-hmm. and that's further that's making your relationship with food further i know some coaches um employ cheat meals they call them or refeed i like to call them refeed untracked I don't, meals yeah untracked, untracked meals or tracked and sometimes you know i you can give them as a as a strategy in losing more mm-hmm. weight, but sometimes I give them as a mental break for yeah. people, and they need that, even if they don't think they do. I can tell they do. Um, and then I've heard of diet breaks all together, where you kind of just mm-hmm. somebody's not really responding to anything. You can tell up here is getting a little off, and I, I personally do diet breaks after my show. I mean, a lot of coaches will say don't do that, but well, to each their own. All a diet break is mm-hmm. is you're basically just taking your calories increasing them back to maintenance and you are just decreasing the amount of work that you're doing overall right and that's usually the cardio right Um, usually like cut it in half is what i typically do for my clients and the transformation of like before diet break to after Mm -hmm. is you have somebody super stressed you know calorie deficit and you find actually when they come back from the diet break they end up at a lower weight than before they started the diet break. So mm-hmm. they actually lose more weight while eating more and doing less. Which right. is really, really weird probably for you to hear. <laughs> right? No, it's yeah. Like, I mean, I've seen it too. I've seen it too. But, um, yeah, so in our cycle, that's a great point. And that's, oh, that happens to a lot of people after shows. They get really mm-hmm. lost in this kind of rebound phase. And um, I think a lot of us are still trying to figure that out. But if there's a way not to go completely off the mm-hmm. deep end and still kind of give yourself that mental break. I think there's just the approach after the show is just having a structured plan. So for me, what I found in terms of competing, having the plan, it's called a reverse diet. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, right. can do it, you can do it slow or now they're kind of employing different techniques where you just basically take your calories directly back to maintenance Mm -hmm. so you can just restore that feeling a lot better and yeah exactly so you don't have to go eat mcdonald's or whatever so that's not what i mean by diet break Mm -hmm. or on a reverse diet upping your calories but like sometimes i just make on my reverse diet i'll up my calories to my metabolism is going so well that I'll just fill my diet with, it might seem like a lot of food, but it's a lot of healthy food. Right. Right. So instead of like, yeah. And cause if you try to bring yourself back to like that, that hard dieting macros, you're not going to make it that long. You're just mm-hmm. going to maybe follow a few meals and then be overcome with this yeah. f- need to eat and maybe binge out well, at night. That's, well, also another thing to include is when you go from eating such lower calories to adding back in more food, um, I'm kind of gearing away from doing it slowly because I find I, don't. I find through experience and then mm-hmm. just clients like the desire to eat continues to rise yeah. as you increase calories. Yeah. Unless you 
take them immediately back to maintenance if not yeah i don't but i don't believe in like slowly upping it i know that's what a lot of coaches say and that's a lot of research out there but i Mm -hmm. think in practice it's not realistic just from what i've seen as myself and other athletes Mm -hmm. i have yet to meet an athlete and there probably are some but I've yet to meet an athlete that goes right into a reverse diet and, and does doesn't it absolutely eat any. Absolutely yeah, perfectly. They don't. A lot of them I see they'll do a couple meals, make it, and then they'll start binging out later in the yeah. day or at night, and then that reinforces them not feeling good and feeling like a failure. And so then you I'd just rather gain back a bunch of body yeah. fat and you feel bad, and then it's like, cool. Mm-hmm. What am I gonna do? Diet again. I'd rather just up your calories so high with good foods. Yeah. Maybe up your fats to slow your digestion, but on good foods, right? So I'm just going to give you a ton of really good food. Yeah. Maybe it might seem pretty high, but it's, to me, that's going to be a lot better than you, than you make trying to fit in only 150 carbs Mm -hmm. and then failing and getting really hungry and and pigging out on McDonald's. And then eating 5,000 calories. Exactly. And then it's like, cool, like, what do I do? Lose weight again? Right. And then you have to diet back down to a good weight before you start your off season. Right. It's also like very damaging to your metabolism too, to go mm -hmm, from lean to fat, lean to fat. And your blood pressure and all this other stuff of putting on significant amount of water and weight in that fast. But so that leads us to kind of our next part of the cycle. So Mm -hmm. You have this binge episode, right? We said you you started the diet, you got into restricted dieting, you start getting these cravings, you have a binge episode, then you feel, like we said, you feel really bad afterwards. You're like, oh my God, I failed, I ate, I backtracked, I'm losing progress, I can't keep it together, you feel out of control, right? So then you're like, hey, I'm gonna get this back on track. I'm gonna, yes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do my meal plan again. You almost feel I'm empowered. I'm gonna you're like, like yeah. I got this. Yeah, and you also have a <laughs> bunch of food running through you, so you feel really you're empowered. You're really, you're really. You're like, okay, that was it. I messed up. It's, all, it's moving forward for now. So you get that desire back, right? Then you go back on restricted dieting. Then you start getting to the point where you feel cravings of hunger again. Then you have another binge episode. Yeah. So that's why this is in a circle because it's a cycle. It's almost like a drug addict, right? Mm-hmm. So it's the same kind of idea. And it does work synergistically kind of with the uh, binge eating stuff. So there's a couple hypotheses on why this happens, right? So the first hypothesis is the reward deficiency mm-hmm. hypothesis. Little hypothesis. So this shows, <laughs> nice. that's the word of the day. <laughs> this shows that studies, studies have shown that diets persistently high in fat and sugar so someone who's Mm -hmm. just eating not healthy they eat mcdonald's every day or whatever fast foods they have these hyper palatable foods all the time this is down regulating their dopamine receptors due to the prolonged stimulation right so what does that mean that means that the individual is going to start to require greater exposure to the rewarding stimuli which is which is the yummy food like, uh, to achieve the same pleasure. So it's a good way to look at it, like we are saying, like a drug dealer. So what are some <laughs> examples of that? So I'd say like like a cocaine addict or a drug addict, right? So <laughs> no, the highly palatable foods. Oh, well, <laughs> some people would say that's highly palatable. <laughs> um, sh- sugary food, like a donut or something. Donuts, let's, let's pick a donut, cereal. Cookies, right? Oh. Just Things with not a lot of fiber in them, I find, right. to be so, honest. So if you're eating something like that, but the, the drug addict reference is pretty good. So if you... Let's say a drug addict, they do drugs every day, right? So nothing's ever going to be as good as their first time, right? And they're going to have to do more of that drug or you're going to have to eat more. You're going to have to Mm -hmm. eat more of that food to get the same pleasure response, dopamine response in your brain that you did the first time, right? Right. So that leads to my first binge episode might have been this amount of food. Now my next one has to be double that. Maybe it was only 10 donuts. Now it's 20. Now Now it's it's 20, right? And you're chasing that first feeling all the time. So that's the reward deficiency hypothesis. That means your reward center, we're talking about dopamine here, that's your pleasure response. You get that as a sudden burst when you know you get taste something good, it's an immediate, immediate pleasure response. So if you are always eating hyper palatable foods, you're gonna have to eat a lot more of those each time to get the same, the same dopaminergic response. And what's going to happen in response to you continuing to do that is you will put on body fat. Absolutely. Very, very fast. <laughs> very um, fast. I've seen and I've actually went, here's a real life example myself. Um, mm-hmm. When I when I competed the second and third time, it was, I was around 122 pounds, let's say. Mm-hmm. In the matter of three months, 
of just this continuing this cycle, I was 160 pounds. Well, that's a long time. I can do that in a couple of days. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean. No, but I know what you're saying. It's but just, that's a long period to feel like sh- It crap, is. Yeah, it is. You know, like. No, it is. It is. It, but th- that that applies to a lot of the general population. Yeah. You know, a lot of their population is overweight. We're not eating good foods all the time. Mm-hmm. And I promise you, nothing is going to take you. You see these athletes who diet down really far. Right. And then you could give them a pretzel. And it's like, oh, my God, that pretzel has never tasted better to anybody than the person who mm-hmm. hasn't had it for a very long time. Yeah. Right. And that and, um, leads us to our next hypothesis, which is the limited access hypothesis. So we just talked about the reward deficiency hypothesis where you have these over, like too, too much of these hyper palatable foods all the time. So this is quite the opposite. So this would apply more to athletes. So in this model, this is intermittently restricting calories to highly palatable foods results in increased stimulation of the reward system when high fat and sugar foods are foods are ingested so that drives in turn overeating mm-hmm. and your susceptibility to binge eating so what is that what does that mean so we just talked about having too much access to these hyper palatable foods so this limited access is just what it says in the title yes. we're limiting our access to these hyper palatable foods so i say i'm getting ready for a competition yeah. i haven't had donuts in what six seven months so when i get that donut my it's just like i said about the pretzel right that's gonna taste so good because I've been deprived of it so long, and yeah. that's gonna that's gonna initiate a response in my in my body hormonally and mentally and all of the above to eat to do the all or nothing right and and yeah and and to alleviate the all or nothing type of approach I right. know a lot of coaches encourage flexible dieting mm-hmm. inside of your contest prep diet or maybe including untracked meals within your strategy to make it successful but. For me, um, personally, um, a lot of people ask me, well, why is your food so bland? Right. Why? I do it on purpose. I remove the emotion from my food, which honestly, that may lead to maybe even a worse relationship with food for me. That's a great point. Because I can't include that normally. No, that's a great point. Because I've found, I've found, like, when I first started bodybuilding, I did very plain foods like no uh-huh. nothing like I, I didn't even think salt was a good idea at the time like oh, wow. now I do obviously oh, wow. but um so everything was like super plain like mm-hmm. but it helped me take away a pleasure response with my right. food I stopped looking at food as something that as makes a reward. me feel good right as a reward and that helped you not cheat it yeah. helped me not cheat I right? do that now right but then as I as I went along and I learned more about nutrition and I got more mm-hmm. comfortable in doing my own macros and so on and so forth I tried to add in you know things that would make my food taste better like like you know protein pancakes or like Like extra zero calorie sauce things to make my stuff taste you know good Good. it wasn't just chicken and rice Mm -hmm. and i found then once once i got those little tastes of it being really good i'm like well this is really good then all of a sudden i'm thinking about like i want more or i want to cheat you know what i mean and i've cheated more when i've made my meal plan more more desirable and and that's what people or like Brooke, like you can diet and have fun, but it's like no, I just want to lose the fat and I'll keep it yeah. off. Like right, like I just want to lose the fat. Like that's my mission. Mm-hmm. Like I don't care if my food tastes good. Yeah, I this don't is enjoyable. Now. Just getting the fat off my body is enjoyable. Yeah, that's enough. <laughs> no, exactly. And everyone's different. And I mean, exactly. I, we're not telling you to like j- just eat you know sandpaper all day but like i mean if that works right like but you gotta think yeah you should pay attention to your triggers and your cues like if trying to stuff really yummy stuff in your diet isn't gonna work too well for you Mm -hmm. and it's gonna tempt you then maybe keep it more simple and leave the pleasurable responses for like scheduled off-plan meals so we talked about the reward deficiency and the limited access hypothesis which are which are based on either constant or intermittent access to these hyper palatable foods. Now, these are unlikely to fully account for the development of binge eating disorders, uh, especially in athletes who usually display significant cognitive or dietary restraint. But the limited access model may in, in, in part account for binge eating disorder, at mm-hmm. least in athletes, like we said, because they're in a caloric restriction most athletes are or they're monitoring their diet some way not even on purpose sometimes just from the sole factor that they're just not eating enough and they're just not aware yeah so there's uh, there's other mechanisms at work besides these you know like we said there's 
Uh, mental health is a big trigger yes. to a lot of this. Emotion. 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 Um, your environment, the people around you. Mm-hmm. Peer pressure is a part of it, you know, whether you mm-hmm. let that on or not. Um, so that leads us to, like, our next topic, which would be... What are the consequences of this, and how do we kind of avoid it? How do, yeah, how do you alleviate this? Because there's not a uh, there's not a whole lot of research on how to solve this. At least in the general population, there is some, but mm-hmm. as far as athletes, it's a little harder because we would tell most doctors would tell the general population if we know that long amounts of time of caloric restriction may put you at a higher risk for a binge mm-hmm. eating disorder. Then we would tell you. Let's take away the caloric restriction, right? But we mm-hmm. can't do that in bodybuilders. As bodybuilding. Or in certain athletes, like even dance, track, swimming. Like, that's just a part of our lifestyle, right? We can't go off diet. It's not like a golfer or somebody who's like, they can take a diet break for, for a month or two and, and still play golf to their same potential. I think within that dieting window, mm-hmm. definitely. But I think there's also a huge association with bodybuilding that you're spending most of your time dieting. And yeah. the reality is, is you're really not. Yeah. Um, so having that time away from dieting, I think could be really, really helpful in terms of when you increase those calories up a little bit, your desire mm-hmm. to eat goes down. And that could be yeah. a real time to like establish a legit relationship with food. It not, can, yeah, it can not be. Not when dieting. But a lot of people, especially as bodybuilders, don't ever come off their diet. Like yeah. whether they're increasing their calories or not, in terms got, of the structure of like yeah, oh, meal I'm, one, meal two, meal three. Right, and even that yeah. or like tracking macros and things like that can really mess with people's head as triggers mm-hmm. for binge eating. Um, so it's a little different from that, from just being able to take that out of the equation right. if that's a part of your lifestyle. So it gets tricky there with athletes. So in order, let's talk about some avoidance um, factors. And this is can help coaches too. So. Yeah things to look out for if you have other psychological problems present like depression bipolar disorder anxiety disorders anxiety for sure uh, substance use disorders things like that these are all contributors to they're not going to put you in a good spot to you'll probably be more susceptible to a binge eating disorder as well and a lot of pressure too like we were talking about like yeah external a lot of environment expectations a lot Mm -hmm. of leaders people in leadership roles actually Absolutely. could be susceptible f- to this uh, type of thing. Yeah, and it, so both coaches and the athletes should be a target for education about risk factors that drive binge eating mm-hmm. disorders. So the, there's different health consequences and eating healthy and reasonable and learning more training practices. Um, you should be vigilant about weight fluctuations and unhealthy eating and habits like that. If you're a coach, you should be getting your athlete or just your normal person dieting you should be mm-hmm. helping their diets i know a lot of coaches that disappear after a show's over oh my gosh that's usually the worst. when people need their diets uh, the most because this isn't talked about a lot and that's mm-hmm. when a lot of people go off the deep end that should be when you're paying the most attention to your athlete's diet um whether they're competing or not once they've achieved the goal they wanted to achieve with a diet plan and you're ready to move to the next step whether it's, oh, I made it to my wedding yeah. and I lost the weight I wanted to, or I made it to my show and lost the weight I wanted to, um, there's there's a next part, right? right. It's not like, it's... we did it, we're done, and it's going to stay here forever. No, your body will go away. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of stuff up here that needs to get right, and your hormones are probably all out of whack as well. Right. So, so taking the time after the event to, you know, mm-hmm. whether you have another event or maybe you're done dieting. Um, yeah. Again, just the reverse dieting process needs to be strategic, and you also need to just gain awareness on these things for sure just being aware that this can happen to you and when you increase food you will get more hungry um yeah for sure and filling your diet with things that are not highly processed is one of my top recommendations yeah and it's hard Um, for a little bit it is you know like me personally i i've been bodybuilding for two and a half years i've never really had an off season my yeah. la- last year I did four shows in a row, mm-hmm. which I never would recommend because I really do believe in the importance of breaks and off seasons. And I think that's how you kind of normalize your relationship with food, not staying in that dark tunnel for too long. Yeah. And I mean, this year I'm taking, I'm taking the rest of the year off. I'm not competing the rest of this year. Um, I could, but you know, I've gotten to the point where I've realized that my relationship with food isn't the best. Right. And I like to regroup and that's super important. That's how you make it 
in the long run, not just as an athlete, but as a lifestyle person too. And I'm, I'm telling you, I've, I've dieted pretty, pretty damn hard. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've been in the, in the trenches with diets and I've been, now I'm trying to put myself in a position where I can get a better relationship with food mm -hmm. and get a better, you know, mental relationship with yourself. Cause it's very important. You're not going to be able to hard diet and do the things it takes to reach those hard goals. If you don't take a step back and give yourself some self love, make sure everything up here is yeah. okay as well. And I think the first step for that is just gaining awareness and really connecting with yourself. So Absolutely. Well, why are these events happening? Well, mm -hmm. Why am I turning to food? What emotion is driving right. that? Why are these things right. being driven? It's in definitely it? usually something psychological, like I said, like a feeling of lack of control um, over, and that doesn't mean lack of control. That means lack of control maybe over something in your life. Um, or fear, like it's a coping mechanism. Food is can become a coping mechanism for a lot of people as an anxiety response. It's a yeah. distraction, right? People would rather get immediate pleasure. It's the same reason, you know, we pick up a drink and have a, have a cup of alcohol, right? It's, mm -hmm. it, it's a coping mechanism. It's a dependency. So that's fine sometimes, uh, but when it becomes unhealthy, like a substance abuse addiction or when it becomes unhealthy, like a binge eating disorder, that's mm -hmm. when you need to really get a grip on what the cause of the issue is, like Brooke Getting said. to the root of the problem, yeah. really, because it will never go away unless, yeah. whether you're dieting or not, um, to be honest, I've, I've been competing since I was 17. Yeah. And, you know, every time post-show, it's like, oh, something emotional happens, and why do I want to go eat food? It's a slippery it, slope. It, it is. It is. It is. So, um, yeah, so our next, we're going to move on to, we talked about hormone imbalances a little bit, um, hyperplasia. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about hyperplasia a little bit? Yeah, so hyperplasia is basically just um, having these episodes to eat um you keep doing it through the cycle mm -hmm. and then you gain back body fat and to be honest you will continue to have the desire to overeat um until you gain enough body fat back to the point where you've kind of restored your hormones you know things mm -hmm. are kind of in balance right um, maybe you're maybe you've lost maybe if you're a female maybe you lost your period you're by dieting. Your period right um maybe these episodes will continue till your body gains back the body fat to make things, you know, normal. Yeah. Especially and, as a woman. Mm -hmm. Especially as a woman, got girls and guys. Like, I know you guys see these girls, you know, when we get ready for shows and, like, Instagram models and they're very low body fat. I mean, that's mm -hmm. one thing for guys, but girls aren't, it's even harder and m more or less natural, but like, evolutionary-wise and biologically-wise for a female to reach those levels of body fat. Yeah. So it's not something you should try to sustain. It's not healthy. Your reproductive system can start shoot shutting down you can lose your period things like that mm -hmm. um and that's that's you know it's okay to do it we do it for short periods of time for one day to get on stage but after that it's not sustainable yeah definitely and in terms of um, my own personal experience with like mm -hmm. gaining back enough body fat um again we talked about i just went from super lean to really like overweight honestly and unhealthy it and can efficient. happen really fast and i think for me what really drove that number one was emotion and number two lack of structure yeah um so for people that have went through these emotional eating um things or have a poor relationship with food honestly structure really drives results here it so, does it does and it's, it's a weird place to be because whether you're an athlete or not i've found especially like me i do great on things I can control, right? And a lot yeah. of athletes thrive when they have structure. They maybe didn't have structure all their life. Yes. Or it gives you this sense of power, right? And it you gives you a sense good. of control. Yeah, and you feel it reinforces your self-confidence. Like, I'm in control of my diet. I did that. So that mm -hmm. makes me feel good and gives me more energy to take control in other aspects of my life, yeah. like training or work or my confidence, right? So that's a great, it's it's fine. That's a great tool to use if you can recognize that in yourself that you do well on structure. But if you know that, then you also know it's probably a pretty slippery slope for you once you fall out of structure mm -hmm. into chaos with something like this binge eating stuff. And getting back on track is probably the only thing that's going to give you that feeling of structure again instead of that structure of that feeling of chaos yeah. and loss of control, right? So um, in terms of this, like for my own clients, I make it very easy for people, especially mm -hmm. who've went through this. I go, hey you want to eat three meals, four meals, or five five meals a day? What's your schedule looking like? Right. Cool, eat at this time, and, you know, here's, basically, here's what you need to eat, you know? Like, take the thought out of it, 
and um, it's really kind of tailored yeah. to what do you like to eat, right? And that's so, why a lot of people like to hire a coach because sometimes it's easier to just take the control out of their it's hands. Like, it's like, hey, like this is what you need to do, but also like let, let's learn why we're doing this as yeah, well. Yeah, and let's not punish you if you mess up and you're human. Yeah, and right. I think a lot of a lot of my clients come to me when they mess up, and I get. <laughs> This is a huge paragraph like, about so them apologizing sorry. to me. Please don't hate me. Like, don't be disappointed in me. And it's like, wow. Like, I'm sometimes I'm like, wow. You're like, well, it's not doing uh-huh. anything to me. I yeah. mean, I obviously I wish you followed your plan, but I've been there, and I'm not gonna no. punishing someone yeah. even more is just reinforcing that feeling that they're not good enough. They're out of control. The same feelings that are being initiated from the binge eating disorder. So. It's best in those circumstances if you did cheat or you had had an episode, mm-hmm. forgive and forget, but also seek the help that you need. There's plenty of psychologists out there that are that emphasize in sports psychology, athletic mm-hmm. psychology, or just normal psychologists. They they do know a lot about this that can help you, and often it's good to have that third party there that you can get uh, resources on to find, like we said, the root of the issue because the root of the issue usually isn't that mm-hmm. you're hungry. And I think hiding from the issue as well just creates even more of a problem. Um, Absolutely. For me, like, during my times where I went through this talking to other people who have, number one, went through the same thing. I know Rachel and I yeah. had talked about it. And um, honestly, like, somebody that I'm very close with and trust, you just you just have a conversation. And yeah. there's no judgment because they get it. You know? Absolutely. Like, Rachel gets it. I get it. Yeah. And there shouldn't be ever judgment about this. Like... Obviously, it's not something anybody's proud of, but ignoring and pretending this doesn't exist and this doesn't happen. I'm a pro-Olympian bodybuilder, and I can tell you, personally, this happens at the top level of my yeah. sport. And Brooke can tell you, you know, she's experienced it as well. And we see people experience it who don't even compete. So this isn't just something that happens in normal people. This doesn't mean that just because you're at the top, you're supposed to have this like your incredible perfect. amount of willpower that nobody else has and we don't make mistakes. And I really hate seeing that. If anybody puts that out, I don't mm-hmm. think that is what should be put out. I'm here to tell you this happens at all levels. It happens at my level. It's happened to me many times. And I'm sure it'll happen again. But yeah, the, the important message here is that we're getting the conversation started. Not, knowing you're not alone uh, um, is great, I think, as well. It, it, it helps you get yeah. the confidence to get help um, because... Mm-hmm. If you, if you think you're just alone in this and everybody else doesn't experience, that's just going to make you really feel not good. Yeah. And if you ever um, want to have a discussion, just reach out to Rachel or I and we'd be more yeah. than happy to have a conversation with you. We'd love to talk to you about our experiences. We're not uh, licensed medical professionals, so you should definitely still seek the help mm-hmm. of a licensed professional or counselor. Um, but that yeah. is... We've been there. Yeah, we've I, done I, it. I, we've lived it. We've I gotten too. fat. We've gotten fit. We've been yeah. through it all. There's nothing wrong. We're all human. <laughs> oh. um, but one thing we can add on to the end of this because we're about to wrap up here mm-hmm. is our ECA stack at Titan Medical. We have other therapies and ways to help you lose weight while you're keeping a healthy healthy relationship with food. I like the ECA stack when I'm dieting as well. This is just an extra supplement um, that can help shred some stubborn fat while helping with your mental clarity as well. There's there's B12 vitamin ingredients is there as well that can help you burn this fat loss all day um, and give you that extra boost, boost of energy that you need during your workouts and daily activities. Mm-hmm. So thank you so much for coming on with yeah, us thank today. You. Thank you so much for having me. We'll get Brooke's information up here so you guys go give her a follow and check her out. As always, thank you guys for tuning in and we'll see you next week on another episode of Titan Net Time. Thanks, guys. Thanks. What you, what you, what you, what you, what you, what you gonna do?